Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you for inviting me here. I'm really pleased to be here. I've learned a lot of things already this week, and I will learn more. And so I'm going to tell you uh, some things about language acquisition. Uh, in the instructions we received for this um, winter school, we were asked to fill two hours of the programs, one of which should be interactive activities with the students so that you would get to discuss things. And so I will make an experiment today. Uh, I will try to get you to brainstorm on some of the things I will present to you. So at some point I will stop. I warn you a little bit in advance so that you can pay attention. And then you will get into small groups of about eight people just by turning around and stuff like that and uh, make up the next experiments. And I'm hoping in fact to complete my research program with your help, right? <laughs> okay, before I start on this uh, thing, I was chatting with Nina the other day and uh, we started discussing on this idea of the critical period for language. And it's a question that has been occupy, uh, occupying researchers for decades. And now we have the answer. So I thought I would just present you these things briefly. And the corollary is this question that we are all interested in. Why is it so much easier to learn a second language when you're younger? So the data, uh, everybody knows them, right? The younger you, you are, the easier it is to learn a second language. So this graph here shows you um, just a foreign accent uh, of a bunch of immigrants. So here on the x-axis, you have the age at which they arrived in, this, in the United States. And the, on the y-axis, you have a measure of their foreign accent rating. So here at the top, you have the native speakers. And here at the bottom, you have those people who have a really, really bad foreign accent. And to measure foreign accent, what uh, James Flege did here uh, was very simple. They just um, asked the people, the immigrants, to repeat a sentence. So it's a very simple task. I tell you the dog is eating a bone, and you have to repeat the dog is eating a bone. And then they take these recordings and they, they make them, uh, they give them to listen to naive people who just give the ratings. Is that a good uh, English accent or a, a bad foreign accent? And so each dot represents one person. You see two things here. One is that uh, the proficiency of speakers decreases with age. Okay, so we knew that already. The other interesting thing you can see here is that there is a lot of individual variability. So for each age group, let's say those who arrived at age 10, you have some who are pretty good and others who are quite bad. Okay, and so this is something that is puzzling to people, but we, we don't have much to say about this yet. We don't really know why some people are so good at languages and others not. A fact that is less known is that this decline goes on throughout life. So here and now you see the x-axis is still age of immigration, but it goes from zero to 60, right? It doesn't stop at 20. And you see that, in fact, the good news, in a sense, is that when you reach 20, you haven't reached rock bottom, right? You're still quite good. It can get worse. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, if you're in your 20s, as many as you are now, well, it, it's the right moment to pick up a, a third language or a fourth language. It, you're going to get worse later on. And here, so the, the data here, they're much less um, precise as before, it's just on the American census, people had to rate their own subjective uh, performance. Well, they had to give a rating of how they performed in English. So the data is less good, but there's 2.3 million speakers here, so uh, this compensates. And you see this decline throughout life. And so now, this question that we, yes? Right. No, for the other, it was just their own uh, everything. But the, the two decline. So it's the it's it's one decline equally. I mean, this phonology <coughs> is affected the same way as, say, acquiring a lexicon is, or maybe. Yeah, so we all know that acquiring a lexicon is the easiest thing that you can do in a second language, but you also continue doing it in your first language, right? You acquire new words in your first language every day. So acquiring new words is, is reasonably easy. So the things that are hard are the morphology, the syntax, and the phonology, which is perhaps hardest of all for people who lived a really long time in the country. It depends. Again, there's a lot of individual variability. But overall, it declines, except for, le for the lexicon, yes. OK, so there's been two uh, possible explanations for these facts that I just showed you and that have been known for a long time. And the first one was this idea that for language, just like for many other things that we find in, uh, in biology, there, there would be a critical period. So a critical period of time during which you have to be exposed to the uh, relevant stimulus, otherwise you wouldn't learn. So we see that everywhere. 
And the other uh, possible explanation is that uh, since you already have one first language, one native language, there's no space for the second language in a word. So there would be interference between languages. <coughs> You're trying to use the machinery that you developed for your first language in order to process your second language, and this doesn't work very well. Okay. And these two, uh, really, people have, have thought a lot about uh, which of these two would be correct, but notice that they could both be correct, right? It's possible that there is both a critical period and interference between languages. So just before I ask you how, how we could answer these questions, that's a, a brief reminder of what we mean by critical period. So that's the well-known example of Conrad Lorenz uh, imprinting uh, uh, geese, I think. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm looking for my words. Sorry, I'm doing these things in French usually. <laughs> you know, these are lectures, so <laughs> I have to find the words in English. And so uh, what you find is that when the, when the geese uh, hatch, when they get out of their eggs, um, what, the ducklings? Yeah, so this is the graph, and I think the picture says, yeah, so it depends. It works in a, in a number of birds like that. So the first moving object that they see when they get out of their shell, they take for their mother and they will follow. So the measure is really simple here, it's the following behavior. So here the experiment was with Conrad Lawrence himself uh, being there when the ducklings hatched or the geese hatched. And so they, follow, they followed him everywhere as they would follow uh, their mother. So it's a really good um, behavior for these ducklings or geese to have because the mother will bring them to food sources and stuff like that. So following the mother is a really useful uh, behavior for them. And what you see here is on the x-axis in hours, the age at first exposure of this <coughs> moving object and then on the y-axis, you see the, the, the percent of following responses. So when they follow, it means that they've been imprinted. If they don't follow, they haven't been imprinted. Okay. And those who haven't been imprinted, they don't have a mother, right? They, they're going to follow nobody. <laughs> so you have to feed them or they die. And so you see here that there is this very short window between like 8 hours and, and 25 where it works. Before it doesn't work, after it doesn't work. So that's the notion of critical window where you have to be exposed to the stimulus, otherwise you don't learn. And the question is that perhaps we have something like that for human language. That wouldn't be too surprising. Okay, so the question I want to ask you now is how could we possibly test this in humans? Okay, so you see that for ethical reasons, we can't have groups of babies that are deprived of language until age three, four, five, six, and then we figure out what is the critical period. So do you have any ideas? We need to turn to natural experiments. What kind of population could we test? to answer this question. So some people know, of course. <laughs> Think about it. Yes? Well, historically, there were always some children that were left in the forest and told they didn't learn the language, but that's really a small number. But that's yes, yeah, so it's on the right track, the wild children, as we call them. There's many problems with that. So people have studied them, of course, trying to answer this question. I, I just answer this and then I ask you. And the main problem is that these kids have been deprived of everything, like not just language, but also social contacts. I mean, they, they lack a lot of things. So they're in a bad shape, but we don't know if it's just <laughs> language that suffered. Maybe, maybe the, the whole development didn't work. Yes, orphanages, okay. Um, so one of two things, if they're in a good orphanage, they have people who speak to them. If they're in a really bad orphanage, like there were a few cases and nobody speaks to them, then they get depressed and some of them die and we, we end up with the same problem we had before. They're deprived of everything, every social interaction. They're just fed, so that's not sufficient. So children uh, that are hearing but have deaf parents? Okay, so the, it, you, you're really, you're getting warmer. So they're hearing, they have deaf parents. So their parents can't speak to them, but they live in a world of hearing people, right? So presumably other people speak to them. I'm not sure you can play. There was, there was another, yes. <coughs> okay, yes, so that, that's a very good one. It's just the reverse of the one you said. So now you take a deaf child born in a family of hearing parents. So the parents cannot, well, they speak to the child, but he doesn't hear anything. And if the parents are themselves not deaf, there's a good chance they don't know sign language. So he will also not be exposed to sign language. So these are cases where they will, deprive, they will be deprived of language unless they live in a big city and there is a school for deaf children. So now it's more and more common. But especially like 20, 30 years ago, it was possible to find 
uh, kids like that who had been raised in villages or small towns, and they had everything from their family, okay, good care, good social interaction, everything, their development was perfectly fine. They were only deprived of language. So that's a very good case. We can answer the critical period question with that, you agree. H how, what can we do to test this thing, the interference between languages, to know whether there is this on top of critical period, if the critical period turns out to be true? Yes? You observe immigrants to different countries, for example, like let's say a French family is moving with a two-year-old kid to, let's say, Spain, where languages are more similar than, let's say, a German family who moves to Finland or somewhere else. Yeah, so it's, it's a good idea. You could try to do that. The problem is that you would need a metric of similarity between languages, and, and it's really not, not easy to do, especially <laughs> since you would have to look at all those different levels. So, yes, Spanish and French are similar on some respects. Let's say French and Turkish, they're extremely dissimilar, but the phonology is the same. So I can read Turkish sentences really easy. I mean, I'm sure you can read French. So, but, but the rest of the language, one is right recursive, the other one is left recursive. So at some level it's really easy, at another level it's really hard. So it's hard to, to make these things. Other ideas? Yes? So bilingual kids, we know that the earlier you have your two languages, the better you are. It still won't answer the question. You still have the two languages there, they might interfere. Okay, so the distance between languages, the difficulty is how you measure distance. Now, the ideal thing would be to get rid of one of the languages. How could you do that? So maybe children that are adopted in a different country? Exactly, that's the good test case. They never talk to the, their native language? Exactly, so you take children who grew up in one country until age six or five or, or seven, eight, something like that. So they speak their own language. And then they get adopted in another country where people do not speak that language at all. They forget the, well, they say they forget the first language. And we can check how their second language is then. So that's the exact good test, test case. So I'm just going to show you briefly these two things and we'll get the answers to those questions. So we're going to see what happens when you study people who were deprived of language input in their first years, years of life. So these are the deaf children born in hearing families, and we're going to study people who have forgotten their mother tongue, that's the adopted kids. Okay, so this is, these are uh, data from a paper by Rachel Maybury that was published in Nature in 2002. You see, it's not that old. And, uh, until these years, people really thought about these questions. And she did something extremely clever. So here she compares two groups of deaf adults. They both speak uh, American Sign Language. <coughs> And they both learned American Sign Language pretty late, between the ages of 9 and 15 years. Okay. And now the comparison between the two groups is very clever. So the first group is adults who were born deaf. So they had no language between age 0 and age 9. Okay. And then they started to learn American Sign Language. And the second group is a group of adults who were born hearing. So they learned <coughs> English. And then they became deaf for some reason. Then they, were, they didn't get sign language until later on, and <laughs> between age 9 and 15 years, they started to learn American Sign Language. And we compare their performance again on a very simple task. They have to repeat a sentence. So people sign a sentence, uh, a model signs a sentence, they have to repeat it. And you have to know that in American Sign Language, you have extremely complex verbal morphology. <coughs> and so that's why they fail. It doesn't mean, so the, you see the performance here for this group, uh, were born deaf, it seems really low. It doesn't mean that these people cannot speak or communicate or whatsoever. They're just as good as me in English, right? So the morphology is kind of random and stuff like that. But uh, they, so they can communicate, but their speech is not perfect. And so you see here, there's a big difference. Those who had no early language, they find it very hard to get all the morphology correct, right? To get all the morphosyntax correct. And those who had language early on, even though this was English and not sign language, right? you see that they're much better. So this tells us already that this notion of critical period for language uh, has to be true. If you had no language input whatsoever in your early years, then it's going to be really hard for you to learn language later on. Okay, that's a very good case. Do you have questions on this one or? It's clear. Second case, that's the adopted kids. So these are studies that were uh, conducted by Christophe Pallier and he published them, you see, here in 2003. I have a question. Yes. <coughs> this, does, this does not yet tell the duration of the period. No. We, so I don't think, know. well, do we care? <laughs> uh, 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 you could say, well, the scientific question is still a little likely to lead to, you know, they're 
the variation <coughs> good, good? Is it all, or also, is there also individual variation in these kind of things, or is it all? Uh, well, I think, what, I'm not a biologist, but I think what, what you find is that when the critical window is, a ve is very short, then there is not much variation. When it's large, then there is much more. We're talking of years here, so I would expect that there would be a lot of individual variation, but yeah. Yeah, I was going to move the question, but the question is, uh, so it's observed in bird song, but if an animal doesn't have exposure early in life, that tends to extend. <coughs> And so is there any evidence, comparable evidence uh, in humans? There's no way we could uh, manipulate that. I mean, I, you see, I mean, these are, it was already very hard to find these special people. So we, we will never know, I think. Well, it would be interesting because it would then give some insight into the biological mechanisms. I would expect them to be similar to, to those you find in other species. It's just nice to find confirmation that human language, just like so many other aptitudes, uh, has a critical period. So, so the, the other case, these, so these were Korean children who were adapted into French families between the ages of six and 10 years. So I don't know if you know many six-year-olds, but their language is just perfect, okay? They, they chat all the time, okay? So they knew Korean. And then when they were in their French family, so they, they completely stopped to speak Korean. When you interview them at the, uh, when they're adult, they say that they, they cannot remember anything about Korean. Okay, so still uh, Christophe Pallier tried to really um, make sure uh, there were not maybe some traces of Korean left. Because uh, he thought, well, these kids were taken from their first country, brought here. <coughs> Many of them were depressed to start with. I mean, it's, it's a really traumatic event. So he said, maybe they, they say they don't remember, but, but if you look, you will find something, right? They spoke Korean for at least six years. So this is a brain scan of these people, an fMRI. When they're listening to Korean, which is their native language, Japanese, which is a foreign language they never heard, and the same for Polish. And these two are at least Asian languages. And, um, and he didn't find anything. So on the brain scans, you, you don't see any traces of Korean. He tried a battery of behavioral tests as well. So he said, okay, maybe this is too crude. You know, the voxels are not that precise. Maybe we can't see anything, but there is still something there. So he tested them, for, in for instance, on their ability to distinguish phonemes that exist in Korean, but not in French. So for instance, the Koreans, they have three kinds of pas. The pa, the aspirated one, as in English, and two pa, like Lenis and Fortis. I can't do them for you. I don't have that, right? And so nothing's left, apparently. They're just as good or as poor as the French native subjects. The second question is asked, he asked is, how is their French then? Their second language, okay? And he found, again, if you look at the brain scans, that their uh, activity when listening to French was exactly similar to the activity of French native people listening to French. And again, he did a battery of behavioral tests trying to figure out whether they had a foreign accent, whether they were perfect in the perception of French, in the syntactic processing, everything. They were perfect everywhere, just completely uh, impossible to differentiate from the natives. So what we conclude from that is that, yes, there must be interference between languages. Because if these same people had continued speaking Korean, then they would have had a foreign accent and other stuff like that, all the deficits. And in that case, they had none, okay? So the answer we have now to our question is yes, there is a critical period for language. If you're deprived of language during your first years of life, then you won't be able to learn it so well. And yes, there is interference between languages. So if you're ready to forget your first language, then you can learn your second language really well. But most people are not ready to do that. And they're happy to have a bad performance in their second language and keep their first one. Yes? But do we have any idea how late in life this would last? Because they were still quite young when they learned French, but if they would you know, forget their first language at 20? You know? Yes, it's a very good question. So we don't have natural experiments of that sort. There were a few anecdotal cases, uh, like a war prisoner who spent all his life in Russia and claimed he had forgotten maybe German was his first, lang first language. Um, it's hard to know whether he, so just one case, you know, we, we can't say. But it's possible that, that uh, his Russian was never perfect. We don't know. It's hard to know. But it's a very good question. It's very possible. As I said, I mean, the first the critical period doesn't end like that brutally. I mean, it ends smoothly. And, and these were still reasonably young. But you saw in the first graph, even those who arrived between age 6 and 10, they were already uh, less good than the natives. So they should have been less good, yes. Yes, so 
there is a debate uh, as to whether they're completely perfect or maybe not quite, but the simple fact that there is a debate suggests that they, they, ha they have to be very good. I mean, if people cannot agree, okay, they're at least very good. So we don't know whether they're exactly like two natives in the same head, but those people who learn two languages from birth, they're excellent at both languages, definitely. So th there seems to be space for two languages in your brain, if that's your question. And you have to know that around the world, uh, most people speak more than one language from birth. And like in India, most kids learn four languages because there is Hindi or Tamil, which is one of the main languages, another uh, official language for that province, and then they learn English in school, and often they have another local dialect. So the case of the monolingual child is, is pretty rare, in fact. Yes? <coughs> that was exactly the question I was going to ask. I mean, here in Europe, you have people who speak three, four, five languages uh, natively. Um, and if there was interference, uh, wouldn't you, at some point, I mean, if it's a, if it's a, a significant uh, effect, wouldn't you see, get a measurable uh, um, uh, performance deficit in those individuals, and yet as best as yeah. you tell me, <laughs> yeah, that, that's as far as I know, they're native speakers. Yes. So in Europe, finding people who speak natively, like three, four, five languages, is not that easy, in fact. It, I mean, the countries. Well, my mom was still here. She would have been a good Ah, okay. <laughs> but there are countries. <laughs> she spoke another four conversationally. And as far as I know, she was able to speak. In all of those. Well. Now, there are, there are cases. We spoke with lots of them. These are exceptional, right? And the question is how, how really we use this. Yeah, remember the individual variability at yeah. the beginning. So you need a group of people to figure out. But it, it's, it's still an open question. But in fact, I, I think you can think about it in terms of crystallization. So remember the second graph I showed you that it decreases throughout life. You can also see that you're improving in your first language. Even like between age 10 and 15, your phonetic perception improves. That's something we don't know. We think, okay, between zero and one, they work on the phonemes and then they're like adults. Not quite, you continue improving like in the visual system. Yes, you organize depth perception and then you get better and better at it. So, the story doesn't finish at the end of the critical period or at the end of the period when you start performing reasonably well. And so it's possible that you keep specializing yourself for your, your first language or your first and second language if you have to. And that would mean that it's harder and harder to fit another language in. That could be one explanation. We still don't know how many you can fit in a human head without interference. And we know that people get interference even from the second language, like at the lexical level or phrases, you know, so if you spend some time in a country and you speak the second language all the time, you come back to your native country and you start saying these funny things, you know, that, that you shouldn't say in your native language. So we know that influence goes both ways. Yeah, sorry, there was one here, one here. Isn't it, isn't it a matter of input? So, I mean, if you're, if you're, um, if you're moving in another country and then you learn the second language, at home you still probably speak just your own language with your family. But isn't it a matter of input? How much input you get in one or another language? It could be a question of using your language or not, your first language. So even if you don't go to this extreme case of forgetting your mother tongue, let's say you move to another country without your family, so you have to speak the other language all the time. There's a very good chance that you would improve much more, and that's what people say, right? So it's immersion thing. So you can do immersion when you move to the other country. You can't really do immersion at home. It doesn't work, okay? Because you keep using your <laughs> native language. So. That maybe that's a, a thing to keep in mind. If you really want to learn another language, go there without anybody who speaks your native language. You'll stop using it completely for three months. When you get back, maybe it's a bit rusty and you have to get it back into shape, but you can always salvage your first language, right? Unless you stop speaking it for, I don't know, many, many, many years. There was another question, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you started talking about at the end, the, about the notion of what interference actually means. I guess I'm going to be getting a little lost I mean, you, you said, well, we don't know how many languages fit in a head, but that's a little bit coarse. I mean, we now know there's many, you know, if, there, if we've learned anything the last few days, is there's a bunch of areas doing a bunch of things. So there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution to this development trajectory. So what, what, what does interference actually mean? I fully agree. I'm using this very loosely. I have no idea. I can't tell you. And it, yeah, Frank has an idea. Thank well, you. I mean, <laughs> there's one, one aspect which is not exactly interference, but that plays a role is that the exposure that you can get is limited in time. So, like if you if you hear speech for twelve hours a day, if you get twelve hours in one language, it's not the same thing as get 
in six hours in one and six hours in the other. You, if you're multilingual, you get more limited exposure in each language, and because there are exposure and experience and frequency effects, this is going to, to have some relatively minor effects, but there, that can still be measured. But that's not exactly the interview. But that may participate in the effects of multiple languages on processing. I mean, it's a slippery notion, right? I mean, I'm sympathetic to the thing, but it's a little unclear if, I, let's say, you had to write the program. You have to actually put your money where your mouth is. It means I have, let's say, a small vocabulary in language A. Now I want to insert some new vocabulary items in language B, and there's a fair amount of you know, overlap between the phonological systems. Does it mean I can't find a slot, for instance? I mean, interference has to be somehow yeah. operationalized, right? So so vocabulary is a very special case because, yeah, as we said before, you can you yeah, can yeah. learn you that still case, yeah. yeah you continue oh. learning words. Still, there's lots of interesting things. So you probably heard about this <coughs> this whole story about bilingual people having an ad an advantage even in executive function tasks because they're so used to inhibiting one language to access the other. So let's say I want to say dog. There's chien that comes first. I have to say, oh no, no, not chien. I want dog. So you're so used to juggling mentally. That's what people say. It's not clear the effect is that big. I mean, there might be something very small. The meta-analysis suggests there might be something. There's also a lot of failures to replicate. But it would be something of that kind. So when you have several languages, more than two, then then the the, the choosing the correct. Uh, word for the concept you have in your head is going to get trickier and trickier. That's the only problem you would get for lexicon. For phonology, you have other things. So we know that you do these automatic pre-processings. And it's very hard to uh, include into that some processings that were not there to start with when you start learning later on. So yeah, I mean, we can talk about that more later. So one, uh, one aspect of interference, which is well described and there's a good procedure, is in fact with regard to memory consolidation. So if you consolidate uh, a new memory, you know, there's a performance change over uh, the period of time when you're acquiring that memory. And depending on uh, whether you interfere with another new memory or uh, a well-established memory, you, you get an interference effect. So if you present sounds that you're very familiar with, though, that you've learned a long time ago, there'll be no interference. If you present new sounds, then the two new memories will interfere with each other. So I don't know, in the case of vocabulary, acquisition of vocabulary, if you can use that, but it seems in the direction where you may be able to use that to actually address this experiment. But that's because when, uh, let's say, in Morris papers in Science and so on, um, indicate that it, this is very strongly depends whether there's a particular schema, data schema available. Now, in some of these cases, of course, you can say, well, they, these are new lexical items, but they follow still the, the phonotactic rules because they're very similar between these two languages, and therefore they can be integrated well in the, in the schematic representation. And then you don't get interference. So it, it, it depends on lots of factors which are... Uh, that's, uh, okay. okay, so at least this worked in eliciting discussion. So thank you, Nina. This was a very good suggestion. <laughs> yeah, you have something. So I'm a deaf individual that we studied who grew up in a wonderful family, and, but she was deaf, and they didn't sign and they lived in a rural community in North California. She, there, we thought there was a difference, there was a critical age for different components of language. So lexical semantic, she continued to learn names of things, that wasn't a problem. But she never got a hang of syntax. She, she, would, uh, she would overgeneralize and never learn that, you know, what the rule really was and how to use it effectively. So do you think that there are different ages and different critical periods for different, let's say, components of language? For instance, you know, you can learn a language early on and not have an accent, but after three or whatever, you do have an accent? Or, um, I mean, when you think of critical age for language, are we lumping everything together? Or, you know, is there sort of a continuum that's different? Yeah, so this goes back to what David was asking before. It's true that, uh, so, so lexicon again, it's, it's on the side, it's quite different. And dogs learn words and chimps learn words. Okay, that's also the place where, where it seems to, to be a mechanism that it's a bit outside of the strictly language box, if there is such a box. Uh, phonology and syntax are, are very good candidates for having strong critical periods because we know that late uh, learners of a language struggle with syntax and morphosyntax especially, and we know that they struggle with phonology. I wouldn't bet on two if they have two different critical periods, if one closes before the other, 
I, I think we don't have the data for that. Now, in the case you mentioned of that speaker, that person who learned sign language like at age 30 or something, 30. That, really late. So there's also people who claim, like Liz Belke, that uh, when you learn language, it, it does work for you. So it does work also for the rest of your mental activity that is not linguistic. And so she says it's going to allow you to link different modules together if you believe in modules or core uh, processes. So there, there are now people studying this. So you could think, okay, these deaf people, just language is missing. The rest of their intellectual development, cognitive, should be perfect. Now there are people saying that maybe not, in fact. So maybe like even counting maybe doesn't work so well. And it wouldn't work so well because you never manage to learn the combinatorial aspects of counting that you learn easily when you have language already. So there are these claims that perhaps language is doing more for you than just uh, being able to speak with other people. Well, but th this is... Chelsea's case because she, she really got sort of stuck at a mental age of about 10 or 11. So she could do simple problem solving and beyond that she, you know, she never went into PIJ sort of formal operational. Um, but when you say mental age, do you also think her social abilities? Social, she was a 32 year old. Oh, okay, yeah. so that's, that's but, a mean, big in difference. Terms of being able to use, you know, to solve problems and do things beyond a certain age. Um, that, so all, all our performance and cognitive tasks, neuropsych measures and things, we're sort of stuck at 10 or 11 years. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a very strong claim, and people are really working on that. Because you could say, if you remember Fodor, he said, we must have a language of thought, and this is what allows us to do reasoning and stuff like that, and mm. language just plugs on to this language of thought. It seems that when you don't have, when you don't instantiate this language of thought in a real language, then it doesn't that do the same work. So this is a pretty, this is a strong hypothesis, and it's being tested now. I, I can't tell you what the, and I chose a case that was uncontroversial, but this one, we're still, we're waiting to know the answer. Yes. So can I ask Renina's question? So there have been recent suggestions about underlying neurobiological mechanisms for that sensitive periods from being that the uh, inhibition excitation balance in, in, in partial cortex are, are opening this window for for learning, right? And that this inhibition excitation balance is developing different for different brain areas, so then also different uh, like different parts of language might have different uh, windows of opportunity for learning, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that also this inhibition excitation balance can actually be altered, uh, so stay open for a longer amount of time because of uh, like neurochemical processes that are uh, affected by attention, but might also might also be brought up in a bilingual environment, might open this window longer, right? Because of chemical processes that then happen and, and have this um, um, this mechanism being able to so the plasticity stays longer, right? Yeah, but then you know you can. Sorry, I don't want to talk in your time, but just quickly, in aphasic patients who have learned to do complex problem solving all through their lives and have done that all through their lives, if their language impairment is severe enough, <coughs> they no longer can do complex problem solving. Simple problem solving, sure, they need to their appointments, and, you know, but if you if it requires several different levels of abstraction and you know things like that then they start to fail the tasks. And they know they're failing the task, and they can't figure out why. So one possibility is they don't have the language to help them talk their way through the task, which many people use as a strategy. I know I do. If the problem gets tough, I start talking my way through it. They, they don't have that ability anymore, and neither did Chelsea, because she didn't have enough language. So that's one perspective, you know, that, that you know, you need, you need language to help you um, in various aspects of cognition, but you also need things, you know, other aspects of cognition to help you with your language development. So at some point, there may be a different, another privilege that allows you to really integrate those two and use them to help each other to, uh, you know, to do better. And couldn't the problem be that they don't have a mental blackboard anymore? So if you give them a piece of paper and they can still read and write, can they work their way through the complex problem or not? So you see no. it? No, no they still can't. language impairment is severe enough, okay. and, and we're talking about temporal patients now, and frontal patients, not even frontal patients, they have, pro they have problem solving 
difficulty, but for a different reason, because their executive function is yes. affected. But in patients who, with severe Wernicke's aphasias, who have PhDs in physics sometimes, they can no longer do those complex physics problems. The simple ones, yes. But as soon as many different pieces of information have to be juggled and, uh, and controlled, then um, they don't have the opportunity to sort of walk through it. Now, the language there, depending on if they've lost something else that underlies that ability and also affects them. Because, of course, the lesions are not, lesions are artifact of the vascularization of the brain, not necessarily. Not, no, not necessarily, because you can get problem solving problems in frontal patients and problem solving, complex problem solving in temporal patients, but their performance pattern is different. They fail for different reasons. But the lesions might still be affected not only. Language yeah, that's what she was saying. Yeah, so there might be another component yeah. that affects both. Right, so it might be something that underlies both of those things yeah. at some point yeah. that's affected. Yeah. And we don't know <coughs> how we're going to tease that out. That's so I think we should move. Uh, so last, last very comment. Very short answer to that. Uh, the patient Chelsea, she was dead because of her ear or because of some brain? Uh, her mother had cytomegalovirus when she was pregnant with Chelsea. And so that often causes deafness. And okay, so the brain was completely intact. It's just the, the ear maybe. But anyway, other people, I mean, this has been studied. So deaf people who learn language late tend to have problems like that. And, and, and some of them are just deaf because of the, mm -hmm. the cochlea doesn't work. But it's a very good question. Let's move on because yeah. it, I, <laughs> okay. So the topic of my talk was this idea of synergies in language acquisition. So what do I mean by that? So for a long time, people held this view that, that kids, uh, you have these three areas of language. We already talked about that. You have the phonology, the sounds, the lexicon, your mental dictionary, and the syntax, which allows you to compute the meaning of a complex sentence, for instance. And so people held this view that kids went through learning language by learning them uh, one by one. So between zero and one year, they would work on the phonology and the sounds. Between one and two years, they would work mainly on the lexicon, mental dictionary, and after that, they would work out <coughs> the syntax of the language. And there were many reasons for that. So first, when you test like 12-month-old uh, infants, you see that they already perceive phonemes more or less like the adults of the native <coughs> language. So, so there's evidence that they indeed, by the end of the first year of life, they know quite a lot about the phonology. And since when they speak, uh, kids typically before age one year, they produce only babbling, so syllables, right? It, it fit with that. And so people thought, well, the lexicon comes later. So you have to be able to learn the phonology before you have a lexicon. Otherwise, you don't explain this graph. And so on, uh, the same thing between lexicon and syntax. People thought, OK, they start speaking in sentences after age two or maybe 18 months, something like that. They start saying isolated words before. And so, of course, they have to know some words before they can work on the syntax. And this also makes sense just like if you think about it, you say, what is syntax? It's the relationship between the words of the sentence. It's like a function, OK? You start from the word, you apply syntax, and you get the meaning of the sentence. So it would seem that in order to learn that function, you would need the input and the output, and then you can work out what the function was, OK? So people worked like that for a long time. Problem is, as I said before, you have to be able to learn the phonology before you have words and able to learn the syntax, uh, uh, to, sorry, the words before you have much syntax. And as people were working on these uh, problems, they found that, that it, it seems impossible to sort. So you always need information from uh, other places. I'm going to tell you more about the interactions between lexicon and syntax now in that talk. So um, the question of guessing word meanings, uh, the simple idea you have, so how do you learn the meaning of words, right? And this is work by Lila Gleitman. Uh, the, the idea that everybody had for a very long time is that uh, adults would just point to objects. Let's say they would say, this is a bottle, bottle, bottle. And the child would learn the association between the sound and the visual object. If you think that this is uh, mainly how kids learn words, then you have a direct consequence, the one that Lila Gleitman tested. If you take a child that is deprived of sensory input, so in that case a blind child, because we get a lot of our input from the visual modality, then uh, her lexical development should be slowed down. And what she found with that child, you see in a book published in 85, this is pretty old, uh, not only was the vocabulary of that child perfectly normal, but she also knew the difference between two per visual perception words like look and see. So just active perception versus passive perception. 
And they were very puzzled by that. They said, OK, where did she find the information to learn the difference between these two verbs? And in order to, to get a clue as to what it might be, what she did was, uh, what they did was watch all the videos. They, they had filmed everything about that baby. They knew everything she had heard. Okay, so they watched all the videos where Luke was produced and where C were produced. And they looked at a clue in the videos and they didn't find anything. Okay, nothing. And then they looked at the sentences and that's where they found something. So if you look at the syntactic structures of the sentences where you can put look and where you can put see, you have many that work for both and you have a few that work just for look and a few that work just for see. So it's going to become clearer when you look at other kinds of words. Then she had this complete hypothesis that she called syntactic bootstrapping. She said, if you have access to the syntactic structure of a sentence, this will help you a lot to figure out the meaning of the words, the potential meaning of the words. So let's say you take a thought verb like think. You can, of course, put it in a sentence like, I think that he will come tomorrow. This is the perfectly good thing to do. If you have a transfer verb like giving, you can say a sentence mm -hmm. like, I give a book to John again. Now, if you try to exchange the two verbs, you see that it just doesn't work. You can't say, I give that he will come tomorrow, or I think a book to John. In fact, if you try to make sense of a sentence like, I think a book to John, you have to move to science fiction and say that you can transfer uh, things with the power of your thought. If you can do that, then uh, thinking becomes a perfectly good transfer verb. So you see that the syntactic structure of the sentence, in fact, influences the meaning of the word itself. And so she said kids could use it the other way around. They just look at the syntax in, in which they found novel words, and they use that to figure out the plausible meaning of that word. So this would be an extreme yes. Could it be the other way around? Like the <coughs> meaning of the word actually uh, requires the, the word to fit into some sentences and not some other sentences? It's an excellent observation. So indeed, we process words in context. And part of the meaning of the word will come from its context generally, in fact, not just a syntactic context, but more than that. So yes, it's true. The meaning of a word will change slightly. And in fact, you notice that when you, let's say, somebody asks you, oh, what does that word mean? Typically, you will say, oh, in what context did you see it? You, know? you can't just pluck out a definition uh, of your aid. Right, so it works both ways. What she's saying is that kids could use it in one direction especially, even though it works in both directions all the time. And so, um, again, if you look at these differences like thinking or communication verbs, transfer verbs, stuff like that, you see that the kind of structures will be the same in all languages. So in all the languages of the world, it should be the case that a thinking or a communication verb can have a full proposition as a complement because you can think about an entire event. Okay, so it's part of the meaning of being a thinking verb. Okay, so now I'll just show you briefly. She, when, she, when she wrote about these things in 1990, everybody was against her. They said, this is complete nonsense. How could you possibly need syntax to learn words? And we know kids learn words before syntax and so on. She really had a very hard time. So in that experiment, she called it the human simulation paradigm. She tried to prove that syntax could indeed be useful. And she used uh, undergrad students. She put them in this experiment. So she had filmed uh, different moms interacting with their kids. And she took video clips for the most frequent words. So she had, let's say, 24 nouns, the most frequent nouns that were used by these moms, and 24 verbs. And then she gave these video clips to people and they had to guess the meaning of the word without the soundtrack. So they had just a video, no soundtrack, a beep at the moment when the word was uttered. And she said, okay, if I give them just one video and one beep, it's too hard, right? It, it, uh, you, you don't have enough information because for each scene, you could say a bunch of things. So she gave them six different scenes, all with the same words in them. So let's say the word is dog. So at least, let's say in four out of six, you expect to have a dog in the environment and you can figure out that yes, this is the common feature out of these six things. So you do this cross-situational learning. Okay, makes sense. So she made it easy for them. Now we're looking at verbs. So for nouns, they were about 50% correct, right? So not too bad. For verbs, you see that when they have just the video clips and the beep, no sound, they're less than 10% correct. I mean, this is disastrous. You, you can't do any learning with that. Then she said, okay, let's assume that they're trying to learn the verbs, but they already know the nouns in that sentence. So you're trying to learn eating, but you already know banana. So if you hear, I eat a banana, you might figure out that we're in the food domain, so maybe uh, it has to be with eating. Okay, that could help. 
So she gave them just the nouns that occurred with that verb. And you see they're a bit better already, in fact. There's more information than the visual domain. If you give them the two together, they, they get just below 30. It's getting better. Now you give them only the syntactic structures. So for that, you use Jabberwocky sentences, where you replace all the content words by nonsense words. Now they don't have the video. They don't have the nouns. Everything is nonsense. They just get the syntactic structure. You see that the performance is much better. And if you start combining uh, all the information together, then it gets even better. OK, so she has a point. Syntactic information seems to help you guess the potential meaning of, of verbs. And now the question is, of course, if you need syntax to learn the lexicon, how did you learn the syntax to start with before you had many, verb, many words okay, in your lexicon? That, that's the hard problem. So that's where we're, what we're going to talk about now. So in order to acquire the beginnings of syntactic structure, what you will need to find is some sources of information that infants can get access to uh, early on and without knowing too much about their language. And there's two sources of information that people have studied a lot. So one is phrasal prosody, the intonation of languages. OK, we don't speak like that. There is an intonation. And what's nice about this intonation is that it will tend to give you some syntactic constituents. And the other things that uh, kids have access to really early on is what we call function words. So that's all the determiners, the auxiliaries, the morphemes that you stick at the end or the beginning of words, etc. So all these things will tell you something about uh, the words that follow. And if you take, put the two together, so have a sentence like, the little boy is eating an apple, if you speak slowly enough, you will make three units out of that. The little boy is eating an apple. You can also do some other grouping. But if you make three, they will fall here. And now, of course, I'm assuming that David Popper served, solved all the problems he's, he talked about yesterday. So what you see here is that I'm, I'm assuming they have access to this suprasegmental information. We have experimental evidence that they do. And that they also have access to the subsegmental information that I've put here with the International Phonetic Alphabet. But that's just a shorthand. We have no idea what we really have in our heads. Okay. But anyway, if you can put the two together on the same kind of representation, mm -hmm. then it's easy to find the function words. I put them here in blue just because they're highly frequent and they occur at the edges. We know that kids notice them really early on, like nine months of age. And in fact, if you still manage to go further and learn that this the thing goes with nouns typically, you could end up with information like this one, which we, I, I call the syntactic skeleton. So where you know that this first unit here uh, has to contain a noun, probably, because it contains a marker for nounness. And this is not at all a full syntactic structure, of course. For one thing, the syntactic structure is hierarchical, so this whole thing would be the verb phrase, and within the verb phrase, you would have a, a noun phrase here. So it, it, it's not uh, parallel to the syntactic structure, but it will give you some information. And in fact, that kind of information might be sufficient to solve the uh, learning word meanings problem. Okay? Because here, for instance, you can figure out that some of these words here, even if you don't know them, uh, some of them has to be, have to be nouns. Here, you expect a verb somewhere here. And you know that this thing here is taking two noun phrases as uh, arguments. So that might help you to figure out the meaning. OK. So now, what information do we have about uh, a kid's access to these two sources of information? Phrasal prosody, we have lots. I mean, we know kids pay a lot of attention to intonation for many reasons. It's also a good vector for emotions, for instance. And kids are really sensitive to that. And so at birth, they already recognize the uh, intonation of their mother tongue. Here at four and a half months, uh, they notice when you put a, a pause uh, in a sentence at the wrong place, so not at the prosodic boundary. If you give them well-formed prosodic units, then they will memorize them well. If they're not well-formed, they won't memorize them so well. Uh, more interesting for us, uh, if you have a prosodic boundary, then you won't assume that a word might cross that prosodic boundary. So if you train kids <coughs> to turn their head for a word like paper, so these are 10 months old, okay, they don't know any of the words in that sentence. So they turn their head for paper, they will turn then more often for this kind of sentence than for this kind of sentence. So they don't think that paper might be here because you have a prosodic boundary there, okay? So prosodic boundaries block uh, lexical access. And then we know from studies in adults that they also constrain online syntactic processing. Okay, so it's a good, a good uh, source of information that kids might plausibly use because we know they can hear it really early on. Function words, again, we have a lot of information. We know they can be acquired through a simple distributional analysis. So I'm just saying there, 
you look at the things that are really frequent and occur at the edges and you find the function words and morphemes of your language. So kids might have access to that really early. And we know they do. So if you test eight months old, they already have an idea of what the correct function words for their language are. Okay. Just through sheer frequency. And what's really interesting about content words is that you can use them to infer something about the words that go with them. So if I tell you it blicks, then you can infer you, the adult, that blick is a verb and probably refers to an action. If I tell you the blick, then blick is a noun and probably refers to an object. Okay. So we'll see whether kids do that too. So in that first experiment, uh, I'll show you that kids, just like adults, use function words to constrain their access to words. So in that experiment, they're trained to turn their head for uh, a word that they know already. So they're 18 months old, they know the word ball, and they know the word eat. Okay? So one group of infants will be trained to turn for ball in the context of a ball or some balls, and another group of children will be trained to turn their head for eat. Okay? And then they come back a week later once they've been trained. I mean, this is a really heavy experiment. I don't think I will ever do it again. <laughs> And now they listen to whole sentences, and we check when they turn their heads. So some of them have the target word in a correct sentence, where you would expect it, so following a determiner, both verbs and nouns. Others have this target word in a wrong position, so you see you just exchange the verb sentences and the noun sentences, and now you put the noun in a verb sentence or the verb in a noun sentence. And the question is whether uh, they will think that they heard the word or not. So you see that you can do this word-finding task at two levels. Either you say, oh, I'm looking for the phonology, the bal thing. If I hear bal, then I turn my head, I've heard it. Or maybe they could do something more complex than that, which would be processing words in context and say, after a determiner, I expect a noun. So yes, I'll be very ready to respond to my target word, which is a noun. After a pronoun, a personal pronoun, I don't expect a noun, so I'll just relax and wait until something else comes that is more promising for my target. They might do that. We know adults do it. So, and, and the last kind of sentences, this is just to measure the baseline rate of false alarms. Okay, so occasionally they will turn their head just to check if the teddy bear is not illuminated. Okay, they, they're not perfect. They're just 18 months old kids. <laughs> what you see here, so these are the results for nouns and for verbs, the two groups. So this is the percentage of time they turn their head within a two and a half second window for the correct sentences and for the distracted sentences. So you see we have a nice difference here. So they do the task. They turn their head for the target, but not when the target is not present. And here in gray, you see what they do when the target is present, but in the wrong syntactic context. They don't turn their head more than the baseline rate of false alarm. Okay? It's as if for them, this was not their target at all. As if they thought, oh, that's a new word I didn't know, to ball. What might it mean? Okay, they behave as if they were doing that kind of processing. So this suggests that indeed kids process words in context and they don't just look for the phonological shape of uh, words, they look for words that will fit exactly within that context. And again, I think that's what we do also to compute meanings with adults. Can you yes. talk a little more about how we train them? Okay, so it's, it's a standard condition head turning procedure. So what you do is the baby sits in front of an experimenter who is playing silently with toys, so keeping their attention, but not too much. And then on the side, there is a loudspeaker that is playing background noise. So let's say it's playing a, a string of words. Occasionally, you play the target word, like la balle. Initially, you play it louder. So they have this background noise, they stop paying attention to this, and they look at the experiment. And then there's this loud noise. So they turn their head, and they get a visual reinforcement, like a teddy bear playing something. And then the next time you play the target, you lower the loudness a little bit, and so on. And then you test whether they actually turn for ball and not for the rest. So you have this whole testing. This lasts like 15 to 20 minutes already. This is horrible. And then when they come back the week, those kids, like about 50% of the kids, will be happy to sit for 20 minutes in a situation like that and work for you. Okay. So those kids who come back the week after, then they get a brief reminder of the task, and then they get the target sentences, and we check whether they turn their head. It's an, it's an extraordinarily difficult experiment to run with kids, because the task is difficult. I think the processing itself is really easy, but the task is hard. OK, so now pay attention, because I, maybe we should make the break now, because now the, this will be the brainstorm bit. And so let's take the break and be back sharp at 10, so that we have time for the rest. Thank you.